Hi, everyone. I am so excited to be chatting on this panel. I feel like cozy romance fantasy, cozy fantasy romance is like going to be my thing for all of 2023. It's already begun and I'm here for it. Uh, also, I mentioned on, on social media as well, I cannot take credit for this title um, because I, I couldn't figure out how to combine it. So anyway, I'm so excited to chat with these authors. Um, just in case you don't know who I am, my name is Lily, and I am the person behind uh, Utopia State of Nine on the internet. And so now we're going to have the authors tell us a little bit about themselves and their books, and then we're going to jump into questions from me. If you have any questions, then definitely leave them in the chat, and I will try to remember to like scroll back up, um, and you can ask them whenever you want. So, um, Roselle, do you want to start with the intro? Um, my name is Rosalyn, and my latest book is called Sophie Goes Lonely Hearts Club, and it's about a matchmaker who can see red threads that end up matching seven old bachelors, old Chinese bachelors in our building, and what kind of hijinks ensue from that. It's got themes of food and found family and more food. Okay, is that me? Um, I'm Megan Bannon. I'm the author of The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy. And um, it's a bonkers story kind of set in a Wild West fantasy world um, where an undertaker and a marshal who hunts zombies fall in love via an anonymous correspondence while they really dislike each other in reality. And Roselle, I do want to say that I am a hardcore Beatles fan and I grew up on Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So like I loved your book just from the title alone and then the book was great too. So I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. I'm Kimberly Lemming. I'm the author of That Time I Got Drunk and Saved a Demon. And that book is about a cinnamon farmer who basically gets kidnapped to go on a magical quest that she does not want to go on, but her demon friend doesn't really care. It's set in a uh, cozy fantasy type setting with uh, indoor plumbing and nachos, because while I love fantasy and old timey stuff, I will not tolerate grossness. So indoor plumbing with fantasy. Should I go now? Um, I'm Lana Harper. I'm the author of Back in a Spell. Um, this is the third book in the Witches of Thistle Grove series, which is about four uh, witchy families in an enchanted town in Illinois called Thistle Grove. Um, and this one is specifically about a member of the Blackmore family who are kind of the reviled, strongest, um, most loathed magical family in town. Um, and she ends up kind of... Um, accidentally eloping with a normie who has no magical powers but starts developing some at the same time as her magical power surge and so there's like a big mystery and kind of a, a very reluctant relationship by proxy between the two of them um, and they're just sort of trying to get to the bottom of it and then also having lots of spicy and cozy moments so Hi, I'm Sangu. I'm the author of The Very Secret Society of Irregular Witches. It's um, it's kind of like um, Mary Poppins meets Practical Magic meets uh, probably some other stuff that I'm blanking on right now. Um, I mean, you would think after all this time I would know how to pitch my book, but alas, no. <laughs> But it is about um, a lonely British witch who is grown up in a world where witches are supposed to stay apart because if they spend too much time together, their magic could mingle and create a massive surge that would attract the attention of, you know, the rest of the world. Um, and she's kind of going along with her life and living day by day. And she gets a mysterious message asking her to come and become like a tutor to three young untrained magical witches and in doing so sort of finds the family she never had. Yeah. Okay, the first question that I wanted to start off with is about our title. Um, so I wanted to know, so the original idea for me, at least for this whole panel came together because I was thinking about like a fantasy world or fantastical elements in a world 
but also where there's a sense of coziness, I guess, to me. <laughs> coziness is relative, obviously, but coziness to me at least, um, and also a romance element to the plot. So I wanted to know, what does either the term cozy fantasy or cozy romanticy mean to you? Uh, Roselle, do you want to start? To me, it's just being able to, like, it's not stressful. Like, you can curl up on a rainy day with, like, a bunch of blankets and, like, a cup of cocoa with marshmallows and just basically enjoy yourself. You're not you're not going to be stressed out. You know that you're going to enjoy the ride, that you're going to be, like, reading through the pages. It's It brings all of that comfort, but also the magic. That doesn't mean that it's going to be quiet. It could have all of its, like, allure and, like, adventure, but it's within that kind of I'm not going to be stressed out to me situation. I love the cocoa. I agree. Um, Megan, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I think for me, um, cozy fantasy is is a fantasy where the stakes are like very personal. And I think a lot of fantasy is kind of big and epic and the actions of the characters have like huge world effects for like everybody in the world. Whereas in a cozy fantasy, and I think romanticy too, because it's very character driven because it's about two people falling in love. The stakes are not necessarily low, but they're very personal. What their, what, whatever their actions are, are gonna affect those characters, but not necessarily like the, the whole world at large. Lana? Yeah, it's exactly what Roselle and Megan said. Um, the other thing that I always think about in terms of cozy romanticity specifically is that to me, the setting has to be somewhere where um, I would like to escape to, where I would like to feel safe in different ways. Uh, like Thistle Grove was 100% that for me. I was writing the first one, especially in the middle of the pandemic. And I was thinking like, what if you could have like a Halloween scented Yankee candle? What would it be like to live inside one and just be really delighted and not feel like you had to leave and not feel stressed out? So it is sort of like, um, a setting that wraps around you and that feels like that sort of feeling of reading underneath blankets, but also has, you know, mystery and allure and isn't quite our world, but is sort of a, a softer, warmer, more interesting version of our world, I guess. So I think the only thing I'd add to that is I love a good quest, so I don't mind some stakes, but I really don't want emotional angst and stuff like that in my cozy fantasies. So I'm fine if you want to take me on an adventure, but please don't kill the mentor. Don't kill a dog. I will cry myself to sleep. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I don't think there's a whole lot to add there. For me, it is pretty much all of those things. Um, yeah, I think it's sort of like, it's not necessarily low stakes. It's more like medium stakes. It's, um, th there is probably, there, there might be some peril, there might be, you know, adventure and quests, and there might be, you know, a certain threat looming on the horizon. But I feel like it's going to be very um, focused on the main characters. I mean, like Megan said, it's not going to be a quest or a threat that threatens the world. It's going to be a threat to this small, cozy town or this small family or, you know, just these two people. Um, yeah, and I think also the other thing that I found that I've noticed in pretty much all the cozy fantasies and romanticies that I like is um, that that emphasis on found family and the bonds of community is just so strong. Like, even if it's just, and when I say community, I don't obviously mean like a whole city necessarily. I mean more like, like a few people in a house or a few people in a town. And I think that that's, at least that's what I've noticed seems to really resonate with both readers and writers alike is that idea of found family. Yeah, I also love how in these, like in the books alone on our panel as well, to me, they all gave me like that vibe that I'm talking about, but they also have such different like elements and different atmosphere you know I mean like all of these combinations of everything you all are talking about but in different ways right and that's why that's why that question also was like how do I frame this but anyway um I want to talk a little bit about the fabulous romance elements because obviously that is part of our panel title but also like the romance 
romanticy part of um, this term now that has been born here. Um, and I want to know when you had the idea for these books, did you immediately have a clear picture of who the love interest or side characters were? Because I think that, I mean, obviously all books I feel like should have some great grounding in character, but I think that cozy romanticy, like that's what really gets you, right? Like these super grounded characters. And I think it also ties into what we're talking about, right? Found family, the stakes, the, the everything that we're getting, like that vibe. Um, Megan, do you want to start? Hello. Um, sure. You know, I'm so bad when it comes to talking about craft because I don't know what I do. I really don't. It's like, it's a slog. It's a mess. I am not very intentional. And somehow at the end of it all, I have a book. I, I don't know. Like the undertaking of heart and mercy was basically two ideas that came together. It started life as, um, a young adult retelling of Much Ado About Nothing that really went nowhere, but it had kind of the secret pen pal romance going. I had the little the little animal messengers. Um, so they kind of, they were there first and there was a tall skinny guy in that book. And I'm like, well, what if I wanna write this other story about like this undertaker, can I bring this guy along? What would he look like if he was in his mid thirties? Oh, okay, actually I'm very fond of that. He will come too, you know? And so, it was a really fun book to write and uh it was another pandemic book where i was writing it when everything was just awful and it was kind of like an escapist thing and it, what was great is everybody that showed up on the page just like showed up ready to go so it's like well heart needs somebody to mentor and then ten rose duckers shows up and he's just a delight and every single character that came on ended up kind of just having their voice and were they were just super fun to write. And I would love to say that, yes, I planned it all and I'm, you know, like it was all what I intended, but it just happened that way. <laughs> I love that it started with Much Ado About Nothing. I feel like my, my pitch for your book to everyone who's asked me has been You've Got Mail yeah uh, meets the wild west supernatural <laughs> and that's and that's like accurate and i backed into the you've got mail plot like i did not set out to retell shop around the corner any of those secret pen pal romances that was like this would be really fun if these people fell in love via letter and they don't know who they're writing to wait <laughs> i was like wait a minute i'm not the first person to do that but yeah i mean you've got mail is definitely a good comp for it lana uh, I think I had, because this was the third book in the series and I sold these books on proposal, I had the couples picked out way ahead of time. <laughs> so it was probably the least spontaneous couple I have ever written, which is funny because I used to consider myself like a panther and I was like, I don't know, something will happen, mostly atmosphere and some dialogue and hopefully some like some kind of chemistry between them. But um, because I had to write these books in such a tight schedule, I had to have a really clear idea in mind with, you know, who are these people? What, how, why would they ever fall in love? I mean, sometimes you have the enemies to lovers or the opposites attract, but there has to be some kind of counterbalance or some sort of like deep attraction between them that you can at least pinpoint for yourself. And so this out of most of the books was sort of a wish fulfillment book for me where Nina works through a lot of really weird, it's kind of in a way her um, proto origin, like her villain story, her villain origin story, if she had gone a certain path and she chooses not to. And part of the reason she doesn't do that is because she has this fabulous moral center in Morty who completely changes her perspective on how to interact with a very toxic family and all of the very um, detrimental ways that uh, families like hers perceive the, the mundanes, the normies of that world. So I did a lot of that um, kind of building in advance because I needed to understand why these two wildly different people were ever going to be into each other. So in that sense, I thought about it much more than I than I normally do about my couples because I because I had to. Kimberly? So I'm about to show my nerdiness with this one, but the idea for Fallon, the main character of my first book, actually came from Zelda Breath of the Wild. So while I was playing the game, I actually went up to this mountain and then there was a dragon 
who was basically covered in all this ick and you had to get it off to save the dragon. And I thought it was like such a cool giant creature that I'm just like, man, what if that's the kind of dragons we saw in romance novels instead of like the standard European ones? But then it became like a wish fulfillment thing. Like, oh, I kind of want to see like, what would someone like me do in that scenario where they're like drag kicking and screaming on a quest they don't want to be on. And then it just kind of fell in place from there. Sangu? Oh, is it me? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got so caught up in listening to everybody else. Um, what was the question? <laughs> oh, hold on. The, <laughs> the question was, uh, when you had the idea for these books, did you have a, immediately have a clear picture of who the love interest or the side character is? Yes. Um, yes. Not so much the love interest. I knew I wanted to do a Grumpy Sunshine Um story because I you know I love love that trope um and I knew that my witch was going to be the sunshine one so in that sense I knew that there was going to be a grumpy love interest but it was the rest of the family at Nowhere House that were just clear to me from the start like there was no like zero like Megan said zero character building happened there it was like I thought who are these people oh there they are um and like Working with Jamie and Mika was <clears throat> a little bit harder because um, I needed to kind of dig further into who they are and what they want and why they don't get along to start with and then why they do eventually and how the grumpy sunshine dynamic plays out. But yeah, I think I don't think I would have had as much fun working on this if I hadn't had those side characters. Um, they're sort of grounding me and just making me really excited to work on the book some more. Um, I mean, yeah, I love Mika and Jamie, I really do. And the more I worked on it, the more I loved them. But I do love that the rest of the family was just there from the start. Like, I have such a soft spot for them because of that. Rosal? For me, the old ducks um, came to being from an article that I read because of the one child policy in China. There's a lot of bachelors in China without a bride. And some of these bachelors decided to live in a village together. And because they're all, they're all old men, they call themselves the old ducks and it was called an old ducks village. And I'm like, I really like this idea. I think what would it be like to place this in Toronto but think about all of my, my grandparents and what they're like and how crotchety would they be? Would they be crotchety? Would they be happy? And that's kind of like how this ended up. But the funny thing is that with the characters, I didn't set out to write a Snow White retelling, but that's where it ended up, which is the oddest thing in that, like, yes, like my matchmaker is Snow White. The evil queen is her mother. And you have these seven dwarves who basically make her life so much richer. And for as for her love interest, um, I knew that it had to be somebody who's a client where you have that conflict. You have that conflict there where you have somebody you're not supposed to fall in love with, but that ends up happening. I never even picked up on the Snow White thing till you just said it. But it makes sense though, doesn't it? It does. Mm -hmm. No, as soon as you said it, I was like, wait, what? Is that real? Yeah. <laughs> and it is. But that was that wasn't intentional, right? <laughs> no, it just it was one of those subconscious weird subconscious things that you just kind of it's sort of like when you're working on something and you, you're hyper focused on it and then everybody else will look around you and go, oh, you're painting like a garden. You're like, no, I'm just painting this flower. They're like, no, you're painting a garden. I can see it. It's all filled out. It's one of those perspective things. Okay. Um, we have a lot of questions so, <laughs> so far. Um, you can still feel free to drop the questions in the chat. I did want to go to one of the questions because I thought it was really fun um, considering that, um, Lana, you said the series started as a story inspired by Halloween Candle. Um, and so our question is from the same person and they want to know what was the spark that started each of these books slash series. So Lana, do you want to start? Sure. So um, 
when I say that I was inspired by the idea of living in a Halloween candle, that's sort of um, the second step to it. Um, this was a very intentional step for me. Um, I had been wanting to cross over into adult fiction and I've been writing exclusively young adult up until then. And I really wanted to get into sort of more adult themes and also just like open door bedroom stuff. Like I was really tired of not being able to do that. And I love that in books. And so I was just like, yeah, like this is going to be not a fade to black book. So what am I going to do? And so I sort of put my head together with my agent um, and she had at the time there, there was, there were no other witchy rom-coms. Maybe one had sold, I think. Possibly Aaron Sterling's book was already sold. And she was like, well, you know, I keep hearing editors are looking for witchy rom-coms. Witches are your thing. Like, you're incapable of writing a book that's not about witches. So, like, you're good there. And then what if you wrote a rom-com? Like, would that be something interesting for you? And so we went back and forth um, and we functionally brainstormed, like, one-liner synopsis ideas of what would this book be about. And it was, in fact, my agent's idea, the very first sort of moment of like, what if you did John Tucker must die, but everyone is witches and two of the women fall in love with each other. And I was like, what? That's crazy. It's perfect. Like, I have to do this. So once I started writing it, um, it was this wonderful escape for me. And I was so excited about every aspect of it. And to echo, I think... Um, a lot of what a lot of people have said, it did feel like I was finding something that already existed, which I had never had the experience of before. It was almost like I imagine like being an archaeologist and you're like, oh my gosh, here's like an urn and here's like a terracotta soldier, like things that I didn't make, I just found them. And so a lot of the book really felt like excavating something that existed independently of me. And the while I was doing that, I kept trying to amp up the idea of this is somewhere I would want to live. This is somewhere I would feel safe and happy, especially because there there is a lot of sort of queer identity and love in these books. Um, and I wanted them to feel like they were happening in a world where that was never going to be the source of the stakes or the angst. Like there wasn't going to be coming out stories. There weren't, you know, none of the None of, none of the pain was going to be tied to identity or to who you chose to love. So it was very much, I guess that's probably the opposite. Like I made it seem like, oh, I just wanted to be a simple Yankee candle. But actually I was, try I was trying to make a whole <laughs> new world that was much nicer than the one that we currently live in in a lot of ways. So yeah, it was supposed to be both things at once. I wanted it to be complicated in the sense that you could imagine yourself being there, but also very simple and that everyone could just be whatever they wanted to be. And it was never going to come into question. So I hope that I hope that makes sense. Kimberly, do you want to share what your spark was? Oh, um, yeah, my friend and I were talking about how funny it would be if you had a person who was like a background character, like an NPC forced to become a main character. And she's just like, but I really don't want to do that ever. And they're just like, but you're going to, but you're going to. So then I thought, like, what would force her on a quest? And I'm like, oh, what if a demon threatens her family? And boom, it just <laughs> came on from there. Good old fashioned demon tactic. <laughs> <laughs> Come with me or, you know, I'll just murder your family. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But I felt like that was super re relatable as well. Like the your main character for that precise reason, right? Like in these stories and these epic fantasies, a lot of them historically have been like one main character mm -hmm. but there are so many people in the background who like don't want to live that life <laughs> 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 it's like cinnamon says she would much rather not get her guts ripped out by an orc so she was fine staying on her farm and minding her business mm -hmm. as we all would be <laughs> um sangu the spark yeah, that um, started I your books sorry <laughs> I love that you <laughs> that you made sure to repeat the question in case I forgot again. I did not forget <laughs> um, the spark. Uh, so this was a pandemic book, and like I kind of like it makes me feel a little bit icky saying that it the, the pandemic was the spark because mm -hmm. um, it's a very it's a, it's a grim spark, uh, but. It was the spark in as much as it made me feel like until that point, until 2020, all of the books I'd been working on were um, intense. They were angsty. They were YA and middle grade, but, you know, high stakes, world ending stakes, um, death and stuff, big stuff happening. Mm -hmm. I was like, 
I would really like to just escape into a world where big stuff is not happening, where there's no pandemic, there's no world ending stakes, there's no, um, that you're never in any doubt at any point that things will be okay. That even when things go wrong, even when, you know, there's um, drama or like trouble, and you still know as a, I knew and reader would know that it's all going to work out fine. Um, but I think that certainty was something that was so absent in 2020 and 2021. Like none of us knew, um, like there was this unprecedented thing where everybody across the globe was united in this sense of complete uncertainty. And I really needed certainty. So in that sense, that was the spark. But, but on a happier note, like bet that there were other sparks, you know, sort of like, like I live in Norfolk in the east of England, and that's where Nowhere House is. It's a house by the sea. And I've always wanted to live by the sea. Um, the more I think about it, the more I think maybe it wouldn't be for me because I hear that, you know, it's cold <laughs> and windy. But I've always wanted it. I've always loved the sea. And so I really wanted to kind of set the book in this um, sort of quintessentially English house by the sea and then populate that quintessentially English house with um, characters of color and queer people and make it a space where they are living their best lives. And yeah, and really that was it, sort of a love of, where I live and the pandemic. Yeah, but I don't, I think that's super relatable. And I think that's probably why a lot of readers did turn to romance, like as a genre, but also to this. I know that for me, yeah, I think that the amount of romance books I read since 2020 has like exponentially just like taken off entirely you know like it's the thing now regardless I will read every night before bed like no matter what I won't read anything else but like I think every yeah yeah I think there's just this real need that we all have for that happy ending and if there's one place where we can be certain we'll get a happy ending it's in a romance novel um that is sort of like the selling point is happy endings You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. <laughs> it's only been three years, right? Um, what was your spark, Megan? Um, my, you know, there was like a, a few things that came together. Um, but I think the, the main spark was I found, I just happened upon a photograph on Pinterest. And I think it's a Steve McCurry photograph, but I've never been able to find the, store, the source. But it's the photograph of a dog specifically a boxer sitting on like a folding chair in front of a storefront. Um, and behind the dog is an advertisement in big letters that says some, it's something like we can send dead body anywhere, anytime, anyhow. And there's like exclamation points. Like we can send a dead body, you know, and, and like phone numbers that you can call. And I, 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 it just struck me, you know, like, it, like, obviously, that's a service you need in this world. Like, I have personally had to use a service that involved shipping someone's remains from one place to another because people die away from home all the time. Or like, maybe they've moved on as an adult, but they want to be buried in their childhood home. Or, you know, um, so that I think what got me was the, the need to advertise it. Like, to me, that's something you look for when you need it. I don't, you know, how many people are like, wait a minute. I saw that advertisement and I need to ship a dead body. Like, that's, it just, and so, and so I started asking myself, like, in what world, other than this one, would you need to advertise the fact that you can send a dead body somewhere? And it just, like, it just automatically led to zombies which I don't even <laughs> like zombies. I don't. I usually don't like zombie stories, and and it just kind of went from there. And then I'm like, well, what about that tall, skinny guy with the rapier in that Much Ado About Nothing book that didn't work? He's got a rapier. Here's some zombies. 
maybe there's like uh like maybe the appendix is what holds the human soul and that's why he needs a rapier you know and it just kind of <laughs> and and again as sangu said pandemic book like you know it was just kind of this um it's really weird to be writing a book about death during a pandemic and yet it ended up being this kind of warm comforting book i i don't know what to tell you my brain works in strange ways but that's <laughs> that's where the book came from I just uh, want to reply to that really fast because I think I often have the same process. And I think it's funny when people ask you, like, what did you, you know, what sparked this book? What's your inspiration? They expect this, like, neat idea. And you're like, I don't know. It's like six different things. And it's like a leftover sandwich. And so often that's the case where you've had, like, you have, like three different documents. You've got, like, eight separate thoughts. And you're like, hey, I'll just pull from here, pull from there. And it's like the ultimate messy creation. Like, nothing is clean about it. I just think yeah. it's always fun. I end up reusing, like I, I admit this openly, I end up reusing a lot of stuff that didn't make it into previous books. Um, sometimes I've even reused the stuff that did make it into previous books, but, you know, hopefully not in an obvious way. <laughs> but I think, yeah, that idea of kind of um, stealing from yourself as well as your own ideas from like years ago or like a little note you saw somewhere or like a random Pinterest picture. I mean, I love it. I think it's so fascinating how the weirdest things can turn into a theoretically cohesive book at the end. Isn't it kind of, it's like lucid dreaming, like, you know, the way you're yes. writing stories out of random stuff. And it's like, you're just doing that except you're awake. <laughs> so it's even <laughs> weirder what comes out ultimately, but hopefully more coherent. Uh, Roselle, what was a spark for your book? So for the first book, for Natalie, it was about a chef. Vanessa was about a clairvoyant, a fortune teller. And I thought Sophie has to be about a matchmaker. And for me, I wanted to write a book about people that we don't normally look at, like old people. Like, I, I enjoyed all of my weekends with my grandparents going to Asian grocery mall, like malls and Asian malls and grocery stores and watching them like play mahjong and it's just kind of bringing that coziness just to see to get a glimpse of what it's like like for for their lives that it's not all you know what you think of the stereotypical stuff and it's just kind of breathing life into like from what we don't normally see and i wanted to explore the concept of loneliness and how it's universal and that there are older people there who may have lost their loved ones that are still looking for love, that want love. And I had to bring in the musical element because the first book had a musical element to it. And I thought if this is the last book in that universe, might as well add another musical element to it. And I had to bring in the Beatles because to me, it just made a lot of, it made a lot of sense. I have a follow-up question because I want to talk a little bit now about everyone's books kind of in conversation with each other. But uh, Roselle, how is it like or how do you approach bringing fantasy to like our modern contemporary setting? Um, and could you talk a little bit about your inspiration processes or process, sorry, process uh, for your books and their magical influences? I just basically took every Chinese superstition my mom has told me and infused that into my books. Like, stuff like, oh, if you jump up and down hard enough, you will get taller. Really? Does that make sense? <laughs> or when you're sleeping and make sure make sure that your feet are not like facing the window or a demon is going to pull you from your from your toes out the window and then eat your innards. Little things like this, but like softened and nicer and sanitized and much more sweeter with sprinkles and icing and whatnot. But that really is the secret sauce to how I do magic in my books. You know, just little things, a little bit of dismemberment. <laughs> That's so funny because that is like so much of the magic is like from Indian superstitions and myths. And like, I don't know, maybe it's Asia. Maybe they all do this, but like just ridiculous stuff. Like I'm almost completely certain that I grew up believing that I should not whistle, like whistle, like, you know, like, like whistle after dark, lest, you know, a snake get me. 
Why? I do not know. I don't believe snakes care about whistling. And yet, a very long time. I think I'm still a little anxious about whistling. I guess because it sounds like hissing, maybe. They're like, oh, maybe you're like a fellow snake who should be maybe. living with I me. mean, somewhere in there, there will be some <laughs> logic to these superstitions. But, yeah. I just love it. I love that these, like, that there's something so universal about cultural mm -hmm. superstitions. I wish if I jumped up and down, I would get taller. Like, that would be, I would be jumping 24-7. <laughs> I will give you some inches. Okay, I could drop a few. Yeah, I'll same, take some. Same. I'm tired of being five foot two. <laughs> oh my God, five same. ten over here. Same, me too. I love five ten. It's like not. It's so awkward. Just so much. Give me, inside. give me an inch. Give me something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't want like a ton. Just like one or two, maybe. So, so like the the smallest shelf is a little bit easier. I, get, I just want each to one of you shelf. an inch. I will be a normal sized person. So, we'll do that. <laughs> um. Back a spell and that time I got drunk and saved a demon are both stories in a series. So I wanted to know what it was like to explore the world and characters when you have like these opportunities to, you know, go off in different directions in one, one book versus the other. Um, and also, were there any challenges, like unexpected challenges to that? I don't know who wants to start. Lana, do you want to start? Sure. Um, I had never been lucky enough to write so many books in one universe. Um, on the one hand, it's fantastic because you've already established the rules. You have many geographical landmarks, you have venues, you have places for your characters to go. But that's also the sort of the thing like you've established a certain like you can't be contradicting yourself. And so anything that happens after there's the internal consistency to take care of um, that was trickier for me where I ended up doing things like going back to the copy editing style sheets where they had listed all of these various things I had talked about because I would like forget that I had certain restaurants or places or stuff that was supposed to be there. And I would just like make up new names and be like, oh no, that's definitely not the main street. So yeah, you just forget or something. Cause this it's, it's a, for me, Thistle Grove is very real, but apparently it's not real enough that I know where, you know, every corner <laughs> every intersection is called. So I needed a little help, but it's also super fun because you get to do things like write about the absolute worst family that everybody hates and even you kind of hate and then attempt to humanize them a little bit or at least show what made them into the kind of people that they are and so you ha it's just a kind of gradient and texture of richness that i didn't ever get to play with before so i really i really enjoyed it um it's like it is sort of like the stealing from yourself in the best way but it's not it's like you're building on top of a foundation that you already built and you have a little bit more freedom but you um also don't have to worry as much about building up the framework because you trust the people who already know a little bit more about it. I sort of knew I was going to make a series. I kind of just pants the whole thing because I wrote the time I got drunk and saved a demon when I was in a really dark place. So for me, it was like a therapy release. I thought maybe a few people would read it, maybe they wouldn't. I didn't know. But yeah, basically I started writing it and then when I started creating the, the characters, I sort of just looked for what I needed at that time. Like when Cinnamon and Fallon got to Wandermere, at that point, I knew Sin just really was hounding for a friend. Anyone that wasn't Fallon and his weird, aggressive ass dragging her onto every little quest. So that's how Felix and Ambrose came into play. Like one's a basically a golden retriever. The other one's a bit of in between. And so it's just like, here, balance out these two idiots because it can't just be these two the entire book. <laughs> I love that. Did you, so unlike Lana, did you have like all the people for your future, like ideas when you kind of thought of the first one or was it you knew it was going to be a series, but like TBD? I knew it was going to be a series TBD. Uh, I was actually showing a few of my readers the early versions of my map because when I first started creating the book, I basically just doodled on a thing where Buhel was, Wandermere, and sort of like the right side of the map. And on the left side, I just put, I don't know, plan other books. And it was just a blank space the entire time. Um, and so for the very secret society of irregular witches and the undertaking of heart and mercy, both of these books have been your first foray into adult literature. So can you both talk about what inspired the switch and the road to these books? Uh, Megan, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. I think... Um... It wasn't like a choice where I was like, I will write an adult book now. 
I mean, like I said, I st- this book kind of started, part of it started as a young adult book that just just didn't work, which is fine. It happens. Um, I think, I honestly think the book sometimes dedicate or dictates the audience. So, you know, you're writing along and like, to me, immediately this book, as a, as it became about an undertaker and as it became a book about death and what it means to actually live and facing your own mortality, like it just made more sense as an adult novel, especially I think for, well, for both characters, but especially for Hart, I think um, to kind of take the hits that he takes that, you know, I, you need to kind of rack up some losses, I think, in order to write the, the book for in this way. So I think both characters kind of needed to be a little bit older. They're both in their thirties. Um, in order to kind of engage with what it means to die. And not that teens or kids don't deal with that. Obviously, they do. But Heart and Mercy have had a lot more time to to face death and face their own mortality. And it just seemed like that worked a lot better to have those characters be a bit older for this particular story. So it wasn't like a decision, like, I'm done with children's books. It was just more, this. it just made sense for that story. Um, yeah, I can, so at no point did I ever think, yeah, I'm done with children's books, mostly because I have continued to write them alongside this, um, because I'm a champion at biting off more than I can chew, uh, <laughs> and giving myself about 20 deadlines when, you know, uh, but yeah, I think because of the nature of how this book started, the, you know, the pandemic and it needing to be a sort of release or, you know, like Kimberly said, almost like therapy, a way to kind of process and escape. And um, because of that, I knew that it was going to be a very me book and that I wanted the characters to be older and I wanted it to feel a little bit more like me now. Often when I'm writing for um, a younger audience, I'm writing for like my past self in a lot of ways. And this was very much sort of me wanting to write for who I was right then in the moment. And and a lot of it was also the fact that I love children's books. I love reading them. I love writing them. Um, But I also wanted to have that same kind of magical, cozy, soft feel, but for adults. So basically a children's book for adults um, with all the swearing and sex that I cannot put in my children's books um and believe me I have accidentally done so Uh, (laughs) always never in a final draft obviously but when I switch back and forth sometimes I will find myself like writing you know all kinds of things and I look back and go oh wait no wrong book um (laughs) wrong world wrong audience I just i I love that that's the way you put it. The whole kind of a, a children's book and an adult for an adult audience. Like, God, that's just, that's exactly it. That's it. That's why there's like, yeah. yes, you can have talking animals and adult fantasy. Exactly. Who drink whiskey and swear. Yeah. Yes. We're talking swords. Yes. yes. I think that's <laughs> silliness. We have, there's so much silliness in children's fiction. And I think that we're expected as adults to somehow be above that and to be, you know, I don't know, too grown up for that. And I'm yes. Just, no. 100%. I, can't <laughs> I am not it. too grown up for shenanigans and silliness. Um, I like my shenanigans and my silliness. So, um, yeah, it is just sort of like writing yeah, children's book. I mean, there's a reason we all still watch, like, Disney. Like, you know, we still love our children's stories. We love our fantasies and our fairy tales and our happily ever afters. Um, And our slapstick comedy. Like, please, let's just not undervalue the slapstick. (laughs) It's interesting that uh, all of that is completely allowed sort of in TV and film, like if you look at sort of the genre that corresponds to these books, or like Supernatural or Lucifer, or any of those shows, The Magicians, like they're totally fine being slapstick and silly and no one ever thinks twice about it. There's just kind of this 
I think it's sort of the the bias towards literary books, adult books. Like you're supposed to be reading certain kinds of genres and certain kinds of books once you're grown up. And that just doesn't carry over into other sort of media of entertainment. So I think, yeah, I'm all about like having ridiculousness and foolishness and just any kind of, just any sort of fun, like whatever the same things that we used to think were fun when we were younger, a lot of that stuff doesn't go away. I think it's just, there's this thing that's always baffled me, which is like, if you look at movies, like Disney movies in particular, these are all animated films for children. They are designed for children. There is a reason that it's like the six-year-olds who are out there dressed up as Elsa, right? And yet, all of the characters are like either adults or teenagers. They are, have love stories. These are effectively YA and adult stories but made for children. And yet there is no market like that in the book world. Like if I were to write Frozen, it would be YA. And I, I don't get that. It annoys me. For me, I think it's like the wholesomeness is what it's a core. Like there's a degree of wholesomeness in there. And there's also like, to me, cozy romanticy has that, like young at heart that what you're discussing mm -hmm. like being young at heart being able to enjoy all those silly things and whatnot and not be you know ashamed of it if i could add on one thing um one of the things i noticed is that especially in literary books and stuff we sometimes view joy as a cheap emotion and mm -hmm. it's been said like oh comedy is the lowest form of entertainment but why a lot of us are going through terrible times right now with this pandemic and joy and happiness are in short supply. So I think that's what's really resonating with a lot of people with these cozy fantasies. Like, finally, we get a break, we can breathe and have fun. It's just joy. It's funny that, that probably ties in as well. Sorry. Um... Was that, Lana, was that you? Was it was me. No, I was just going to say how, how strange, how ironic it is that joy is perceived as a cheap emotion. I feel like it's the hardest of all of the things. <laughs> like, so true. You know, the other things are in such easy supply. It's way easier to feel depressed or really angry or really mm -hmm. any of the other emotions. And it's, it's strange that we perceive it as trite or that there's something about it that is, it's sort of like the same thing as, as um kind of um putting women's fiction or romance on like a lower tier compared mm -hmm. to like, yeah, that it is exactly the same bias, which is very bizarre considering human experience. That's exactly what I was going to say, which is that I feel like so much of that idea that joy and coziness is somehow smaller or lesser or of less value ties in to the fact that romance and women's fiction is somehow considered lesser and smaller. And... Um, yeah, and I'm just, I'm not, I'm not, keen, not keen on that. I don't like it because, um, A, romance is incredibly hard to write, like just like a straight up romance. It's really difficult to write. It's, it's ridiculous to undervalue that. And like literally half the people in the world are women who write and, you know, and some of whom write, some of whom read. Like how are we still undervaluing the contributions of like, half the people amen and you know and the same is true i just think across the board of genre fiction mm -hmm. because fantasy is also considered kind of lesser you know it's kind of looked down upon but like what we make worlds <laughs> <laughs> i make up religions from scratch come on y'all this is not easy I'm and living also, for this vibe right now. Tell them, tell them that, that we make worlds. <laughs> we create and universes. <laughs> and also, I'm sorry, but a good joke is hard to write. And I really is. A lot of those literary folks are maybe jealous that they cannot <laughs> crack a good joke because yeah. that is true craft. And I will get off my soapbox now. I no, stay on it. Stay on the box. <laughs> Uh, I find it interesting, and by interesting I mean infuriating, that when you think about award winners and they're always like the heavy, darker, mm. more sort of, what do they kind of bring to the world? What new thing are they saying? What do they add to the canon? And I am not saying by any means that these books are not great, because a lot of them, I love so many of these books, but I don't understand why 
or rather I do understand, but it annoys me, that we find so little sort of merit, and by merit I mean kind of like, you know, like a world, like recognition for books that are softer, for books that are not written by men. <laughs> I think like a lot of it too has to do with the fact that <clears throat> the books that we write have as much if not more emotional resonance and people seem to not like they they don't recognize this as well like you have to when you're writing romance you need to have the emotional factor there if it's not there your readers aren't going to be there for you and they just take it's again emotion tied with womanhood like unfortunately yeah. right so therefore lesser than <laughs> yeah i i also i'm just enjoying this conversation so much but um also yeah i've been thinking i think that also we talk about you know all of these different genres and everything like that and specifically also romance and like the cozy fantasy cozy romanticy and yet we always go back to like how um how resonant these characters are like how much they sort of strike a chord within us which to me seems like the most weird thing to like hate on when i feel like all good books should have this right this skill which is so important and will create long-lasting readers but like readership in general right it will in encourage enthusiasm for reading um but then for it to be like oh no there has to be like the stakes have to be higher or there has to be more action more fighting and less like introspection or less journey but like they're on a journey <laughs> they're questing at the moment um it kind of segues a little bit into another question we got from the audience which was are if there are any tropes that are necessary to make a book cozy because we've kind of talked about found family We've touched a little bit about, like, in romanticy, obviously, romance and the happy ending is, like, a trope that is, you know, or not a trope, but, like, it's a, what's it called? An expectation from for the the genre or subgenre. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, do you think there are any tropes that are kind of necessary to make a book cozy? I think, for me, meaningful friendships. Like, every single mm -hmm. one of them have, you have, like, a solid you have solid even platonic friendships that are there and it's part of that that feeding into that atmosphere that it's cozy that it's safe and it's wholesome like it's it's one of those things where i love seeing like great friendships and i think it, i honestly believe every one of our novels have that and i think too that i think there's hopefulness like We've kind of slammed a little bit on the literary genre, but <laughs> which I'm kind of okay with because there is so much of that kind of like, it's only good if it's bleak and then it just ends and there's no catharsis. <laughs> and um, I, I think there's something to be said for um, in the cozy genre that you need to have a certain amount of hopefulness mm -hmm. to, to it that, uh, and this goes hand in hand with it happily ever after, but it's beyond that, that like, there's a sense that you're going to be okay. And these characters are going to be okay. Um, and that they, they have grown as people in a way that will help them deal with whatever life throws at them next. So I, to me, that kind of sense of hopefulness is a really important part of the cozy fantasy, romantic world. Um, in terms of yeah, the thanks. journey, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. No, no, you go, you go. <laughs> I, we're always so synced. No, you should go first. It's always awesome. Awesome. You go, you go. No, I was just going to say that it's um, that that sense of hope, um, kind of also for me, it's hope that even though the story by its nature of being cozy is about individual people in their individual lives, I feel like the like so much cozy fantasy just whether by accident or by design gives you a sense when you get to the end of it that the world is somehow better 
that even though it's a, it's just, it's not a world ending story, it's not big life threatening stakes, but you come out of it with, I think, a sense of hope that not only is the world within the book better, but that your world, that the world we live in, you come out of it feeling just that little bit more optimistic about the world. Um, and that's not really a trope, it's hard to kind of define, but I feel like every single cozy fantasy that I've read and enjoyed, I've come out of it thinking, you know what, maybe the world's not as bad as it is. And then I have to go find another one straight away because otherwise reality tells me that it is. I think I was going to say something very similar, um, which was that this is not a trope either. I think it's just an element of this kind of book. It's that almost every single one of them involves um, a, a type of self-discovery. So it's an internal journey where you either you're having a homecoming that gives you a different perspective on yourself or you're healing some old wounds or you're discovering a new way to kind of achieve the next, you know, whatever it is that that you feel like you're missing so there's a, a sense of a very satisfying kind of sense of evolution where it's optimistic it gives you hope that you as a reader can do this in exactly that way where i think that's that's partly what what sangu was maybe referring to in part just that it is possible to have lovely things happen at any stage of life and you can always find there is a light. It will be okay. It might not be the okay that you thought you were looking for so that everything could be completely unpredictable, but there will still be something to hold on to and hopefully something better than what you're currently experiencing. Okay. I think we have time for just a few more, one or two more. Um, we got an audience question, which I found, thought was really interesting. What were your initial reactions to the reception of your books? Shock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I don't want to be like, oh, you know, I thought no one would ever like like the book because I feel like it's so easy for us to go into this this job thinking that we are somehow not as good at what we do as we are. Um, and, you know, I need to remind myself of this later, but I'm saying it now. We are pretty incredible at what we do. Um, and so, I mean, I'm not saying that I was necessarily shocked that people liked it. I was hoping that people would, but I was shocked that, I don't know, I think that sometimes e even though it was a story that I needed at the time, and therefore it stands to reason that other people would need that kind of story too, even though I'd been reading other cozy fantasies in the read up to publication, um, it still came as a surprise to me that so many people loved the same sort of quiet, soft, warm, whimsical story that I did. Um, and so I was just really yeah, surprised and incredibly grateful for the reception that this book got. I think That's my... Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. So I think my initial reactions were one, joy, and two, panic. Because I figured a few people would read it, but I didn't think it would resonate so much with so many people so quickly. So I sort of just scrambled of, what do I do now? I didn't plan on becoming like a full-time author right away. I mean, awesome. I'm super grateful, but also it's just like trying to figure out how to catch up and deal with the fallout in a way I didn't think I was going to. So it was it was interesting. I'm still kind of getting the hang of it. Aren't we all? Oh mm -hmm. my God. I mean, I feel like I get worse at it. Like, <laughs> with it? I don't know. <laughs> and I, I think like Songu, I was very much surprised. I mean, you put a book out in the world that's as weird as The Undertaking of Heart and Mercy. You know? Who are you telling? <laughs> <laughs> are, I'm like I wonder if there are people out there who are as weird as I am because it's like I mean it's it really was just the ultimate Megan hanging out book like my agent literally told me when I was playing with some ideas to go nuts get weird and every email I sent her for the like six months that followed were like started with the words I just want to remind you that your exact words to me were go nuts get weird 
here's five chapters, you know? Um, and so I was, I, I was really surprised that um, as many people were on board with it, you know, like cars that go from land to sea and horses that also go from land to sea and everything's amphibious and talking animals that swear and drink and zombies and I mean it's just bonkers so I was really um thrilled and also I get the whole panic thing too like a little panicky that that oh wait this is actually better than I ever could have hoped so thank you readers that's really nice of you to be on board with my brand of strange Um, just to continue in the thread of shocking. So I was very surprised, um, even from just um, when the book was first acquired, that anyone wanted a bisexual romance that bad between witches. It was really surprising to me because the first book that I tried to sell, which would have been mm, almost 10 years ago now, everyone was like, no thanks to this. This is just absolutely, no, there's not gonna be an audience for this. No one's gonna read it. And it was totally stunning to me that it was so well received by editors and then also by readers. Um, and I think for the my imprint, it was the first bisexual romance or at least even romance featuring two women um, to be on the bestseller list, which was which is wild to me. I had no idea that was even the case, but it did also make sense because I was completely floored that readers were gonna be as, which I shouldn't have been considering that I had always been looking for bisexual romance books. Like growing up, I was like, where are these characters? I don't know. You know, every once in a while I would find the one story and that become completely obsessed and that would become my personality. But it was a wonderful, pleasant surprise that people were as into it as I was and wanted to read about those characters specifically falling in love. For me, it was the emails that I got from readers, which really like kind of made me go, oh my goodness, like for clip. And it's like, cause I'm, I'm hearing from, it's cross-cultural. Like my readers are actually cross-cultural cause I always thought it was just, it was just really heartening cause they're like, I don't normally write I don't normally write authors, but this one really touched me. And, you know, you made me think of my grandfather or my grandparents and all of this stuff. And I'm like, oh, I was like, there's there's like it's that or they're they're talking about how they laughed and they cried. And it's again, like tying into this whole when you make books, you can connect to people and you can make them feel the feels. And that's like that's the magic of our job. Yeah, I love that sentiment to end on. And I also, I thought this was really like fun question to end on. Um, thank you everyone for the questions um, and the chat. Also, thank you so much to the authors uh, for joining me. I hope that, um, as I said, cozy romantic. I hope that it like continues to be such a thing. I think it will considering like... <laughs> the state of the world. So um, I hope it can use to be though. Um, and I hope everyone has a really great rest of your day. And oh, by the way, everyone's like links to the books are in the, the description box below. So definitely please remember to add them to your TBRs to pick up your own copies and to continue celebrating the cozy romanticy train uh, that we're all in now. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Lily. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Lily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.